Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party of England and Wales. Northern Ireland faces renewed political conflict. As a result of the boss's Brexit crisis, the collapse of the Stormont government and underlying it all, huge anger at poverty and oppression. Since its creation, this has been a deeply divided region. Northern Ireland is a very divided society. When we're young, we're divided. When we're old, we're divided. Every single facet of life, housing, schools, churches, sports, everything is divided. If walls is getting higher in the big cities, the peace walls, but they even put walls between you when you die in the cemeteries. But there is hope. That clip was Donald Coffey, a member of CWI Island, the Social Party's sister party in the Committee for Workers International. Donald is the first elected councillor for the Committee for Workers International in the North, elected on the cross-community Labour alternative ticket. And despite the history of sectarian conflict, CWI Ireland says there is a way out of social division and austerity. There's one place where workers are not divided, and that's the workplaces. The one place where Protestants and Catholics come together daily, and they socialise, and they get on, and they live, and do all the things that normal people do. And because of that, they're also unified in the trade union movement. So it is natural that if you really want to change Northern Ireland's situation, you're going to have to build on the politics of the trade union movement, on the politics of the labour movement, and on the politics of socialism. While a general election and strike wave threaten the capitalist establishment in Britain, workers on the other side of the Irish Sea are also fighting back. In this episode of Socialism, Heather Rawling from the Socialist Party of England and Wales Women's Committee talks to Councillor Donald Coffey about Northern Ireland, Brexit, borders, sectarianism and struggle. This is Heather Rowling here from the Socialist Party Women's Committee and this episode we'll be speaking to Donald O'Coffey, a local councillor in Northern Ireland for Cross-Community Labour Alternative and a member of the Committee for a Workers International. Hello Donald. How are you going? I'm good. Okay, so in Britain, Brexit's led to the downfall of two Tory Prime Ministers. We've now had a government with no majority and Boris Johnson has called an election. There seems to be no way to both come out of the customs arrangement with the EU and prevent a border between the North and South of Ireland. So what I was wondering was, what impact is Brexit having on the situation in the North and what is the socialist answer to it? Very good question. It's having a very destabilising impact, I think. There's huge levels of concern among the population both sides of the divide. Nationalists have legitimate concerns, obviously, around the hardening of the north-south border. That would be consequent from any situation in which Northern Ireland left the customs union. And as everyone would know, if you put in customs posts to monitor a trade across the border, you would then have to probably put police to protect them. And to protect the police, you would have to put army. So Mm -hmm. You'd very much start down a road of increasing militarization along the border. And I think that there is definitely, undoubtedly, the danger that that would generate some degree of return to conflict. There's also, in the meantime, there would be, almost undoubtedly, there would be mass civil disobedience, I think, from people in border areas who just basically refuse this. At the other end, then, you've got huge fears among the unionists, These have been growing for years, maybe decades, in terms of the stability of the North, the demographic change, and all that goes with it. Can um, can you just explain what that demographic change involves? Well, Northern Ireland, Connolly famously said before partition that it would result in a carnival reaction both sides of the border, and Northern Ireland was designed by the Unionists in conjunction with the British government at the time to be a stable majority to remain part of the UK. So there was like a gerrymandering process. That's how we ended up with six counties in Northern Ireland, as opposed to nine of Ulster used to be. And from the very start, there was even concerns then about some of the counties did not have a unionist majority. They would have had a majority looking to leave the UK. 
And part of the way that that was dealt with was inequality in terms of investment, but also in terms of jobs and so on. So they forced people to emigrate. But over time, there was a big difference in birth rates over time. And with the development of 1940s labor governments, people get an education for the first time. There was a greater equalization in terms of how many were staying with the equality duties that come through in the 90s. Again, there's been an erosion of the inequality, and that led to a situation where the populations, the two sides of the community, if you get me, have become quite close. And in general, if you look at the demography of it, the older population tends to be overwhelmingly Protestant, and the younger population, very youngest cohorts, tend to be overwhelmingly Catholic. So there's a big change happening in sectarian terms, and this would therefore translate into potentially a situation where the future of Northern Ireland might be a question. And this is then exacerbated around the difficulties on Brexit, the uncertainties, and the idea of the Johnson deal with the EU has been called an economic United Ireland by sections of the loyalists, and that that then has caused huge levels of concern. We've seen quite large mobilisations in meetings. Now, there's also the other end of the spectrum of Protestants who are completely alienated with the whole Leave project, for good reasons, that they see it as a racist project at times, as many do, and that they feel that they have an identity that's being challenged as European citizens. And so there's a real flux at the moment. I think there are inherent dangers in that in the context of a very divided society. So there's these countervailing tendencies, and the problem is really how do you get a workers' Brexit deal that deals with that? There is no simple answer because really a proper workers' Brexit would take you out of the WTO, let alone mm. the customs union. But I'd um, just like to say what the WTO w, is. Sorry, the, the World Trade Organization. There are obviously systems of trade which are different whether you exist within Europe. Europe has a particularly high tariff. It's a high tariff zone, which means it really discourages imports from outside of Europe of certain types of typically agricultural produce to protect the European agriculture producer base. This has caused massive problems in Africa and and other parts of the world, but at the same time it's protected production in Europe. And then there's the WTO tariffs, which are a level below that, but they're all inherently imperialist in terms of the relations of trade and production and exchange that they codify. So a proper a workers' Brexit would effectively take, or leaving the EU would effectively say, like you'd go to a situation where you'd leave all that behind, and that would require really pan-European change, and that's really where you need to go, but that's a very hard argument to make. People are stuck looking whether it's an east-west border or a north-south border, and so that there are really major problems with make that case. And Jeremy Corbyn's position has been for the UK as a whole to stay within a customs union agreement and there are logical arguments that underpin that insofar as that would avoid any hard borders effectively if it was coupled with some form of regulatory alignment with the European Union trading rules. There are consequences of that because that would tie you into potentially single European market rules but again I think Jeremy Corbyn should, if he isn't, be advocating that those would be taken out of the deal. But even within the Johnson deal, if you look at it, there's even within that, there's codified commitments that Britain will uphold the competitiveness rules which prevent nationalization, intervention in the economy and so on. And this was the same with Theresa May's deal. In any of these deals, they are inserting these additional paragraphs to control a potential Jeremy Corbyn government. From a Northern Ireland perspective, certainly the customs union remaining with Europe would probably resolve the problem. But the real socialist solution has to be for an alternative type of Europe where we don't have those imperialist trade relations with the third world, where we don't have barriers to public ownership of the commanding heights of the economy. Okay, thank you. If we could just talk a little bit about Sinn Féin, which is the main Irish nationalist party. Sinn Féin has for some time put forward the idea of a border poll That, from what I understand, is a mechanism under the Good Friday Agreement which would allow a vote to take place on uniting the North and the South. And the Good Friday Agreement was the culmination of the supposed peace process in 1998. So they put forward that idea. What would that actually mean for the working class North and South of Ireland? And what would socialists say about a border poll? Another really tough question. Um, 
A border poll, it's written into the Good Friday Agreement, as you say. It's subject to a decision made by the British Secretary of State whether they think such a poll might be successful or not. So as yet, it hasn't happened. There's also provision once you have the first border poll, you can have another border poll within seven years. And really, one of the things about the border poll is it's unlikely, I think, even at this stage to pass. Now, it may be with the whole Brexit thing that there's some really interesting polling numbers being released at the moment, 51% in Lord Ashcroft poll said that they would actually support a United Ireland if it was the only way to stay in the EU. But frankly, I think if you looked at the dynamics of it, the economics of it, if you had an extended period of a referendum discussion on a border poll, I don't think it would pass. But having said that, it could pass. So you never know. But the whole process would be hugely destabilizing. It would raise the temperature dramatically. It would divide people. And the choice offered really would be either a capitalist United Ireland on one hand, which would pose clear problems to working class Protestants, who would be concerned that they would be maybe the minority in a capitalist economy, backward looking. There are still concerns around all that. And on the other hand, it would pose to Catholics the potential that they would remain within, if they lost, they would remain within a petition state that they don't feel part of, they feel alienated from. So in reality, a border poll would really be a poll of coercion. For the minority that would lose, they would be coerced into a state that they wouldn't agree with. And it offers really nothing towards socialism, because what we must try to do is unite people, and in the process of bringing working class people together, actually overcome and sublate the divisions. That's the solution. A border poll does not do that. It's a zero-sum game. Whereas what we have to do is we have to try and find ways through the union movement, through the youth movement, through struggle. And it is actually something that as someone has, has been dedicated for the last 10 years, I believe this actually works. You can see people coming together, Protestant and Catholic. The one place that Protestants and Catholics come together all the time is the workplace and the trade unions. And you can see that this could happen, this could change. And I wanted to ask you about mm. that because I think that we've been inspired hearing about worker struggles north and south. Harland and Wolf is one that springs to mind. Could you tell us a bit more about those struggles and, and maybe what impact that is having on the issue of unity amongst workers between Protestants and Catholics? Yeah, well, in the South, there has been an upsurge, I think, in union struggles. Just to consider the South for a second, because it's important. It's happening right across the island. It's coming from a very low level. But most of the union strikes and industrial battles in the last couple of years have largely been around union recognition rights. And what that means is that there's new sectors of the working class are actually seeking to have a trade union. So, for example, you had the Ryanair pilots, not a classical trade union cohort, but they went out and strike. You had Lloyd's Pharmacy workers, the mandate union, Tesco workers. Again, they they were fighting for union representational rights. You had the Nasra strike of ambulance workers who wanted recognition for their own new union. And you had the English language teachers in Dublin, which is ongoing at the moment, again looking for recognition rights for Unite in that case. In Northern Ireland, where I think there's a higher union density and the economy tends to be much more industrially based than anywhere else in these islands, actually, the union strikes have a slightly different nature and it's much more around pay. Northern Ireland pay rates are some of the lowest in the islands. So you had workers in Portadown striking for basically a living wage. Right now, Monday, that's as this is recorded tomorrow, we're going to have a strike in Lurgan with ABP Meats workers who are fighting again to defend shifts, uh, family-friendly shifts, but also to demand a decent pay rate. And in recent times, we've had some major battles in terms of Bombardier, one of the largest workforces in Northern Ireland, Bombardier Aerospace. They actually voted for strike action and was going to do it, but then it was cut across by the company was actually sold. And there's been a whole lot of uncertainty around that. But that was going to be a tremendous battle, potentially. You had in Moy Park, the largest employer in Northern Ireland, its main supplier of chickens and poultry products to the UK market. And they actually had two wildcat walkouts in defense of their union representation. The union didn't authorize that, but it happened spontaneously on the kill line. 700 workers walked out. Fantastic. And in Harlem Wolf, we had a nine-week occupation of the shipyard to save the jobs. And there's some uncertainty around that still, but it actually achieved at least the saving of the jobs. And I believe that that will hopefully work out into the future. But there is an upsurge in terms of things. Wright Bus is another major employer, builds buses in Ballymena, the largest union march for jobs.
the situation in Ripos, I could explain in some details. It's a really fascinating situation where a, a millionaire owner has put a lot of money into a church. This is the sort of nature of Northern Ireland stuff. Yeah. Next to the, the right bus where he's built this amazing church, 16 million pound went into it. Mm-hmm. And he has a throne because he's the preacher there. Because this, the company went into problems and it has been bought, but it was the union intervening that actually guaranteed that that would happen. Otherwise, those workers would not have a job. So it was a tremendous fight from industrial workers. My own area, Balcast, we had a strike of timber workers in a timber yard. Two day strike completely destroyed the, it just won so quickly. It was a really quick victory. Got there a thousand pound each in terms of benefit to the workers. And then in the public sector, we've had a series of strikes with the civil servants. We've also got almost all the unions in health are now balanced for strike action. This will be the first strike of nurses in 103 years in Northern Ireland. It's never happened. Nurses have never went on strike. And it's because of the poverty pay rates. Northern Ireland NHS workers are paid less than any other part of the UK. And then the CWU strikes going to affect us. So there's a massive upsurge. What's the significance of this? Yes, there is definitely a turning back to the unions. We have a failure of politics. But also it reflects, I think, there is a great destabilization in Northern Ireland, whether it's Brexit, the lack of functioning government, the economic crisis, the impact of austerity on a society which is hugely dependent on public expenditure. All these things at the same time, you've sectarianism, you've still got terrorism, you know, you've got individual violence. You've got all these things in a society and you've got countervailing tendencies. On one hand, you've got the tendencies want to rip things apart to take us back into conflict. And on the other side, you've got the progressive movement of the workers. And this is something that's happened in history in Northern Ireland a lot of times in the past. When things go bad, you can get both positive and negative features at the same time. So the importance of what we have to do is cut across the tendencies which are negative, cut across the forces that want to divide, and show that the unity of the working class can actually transform the situation. Brilliant, thank you. And you mentioned that Northern Ireland currently doesn't have a government, so it's effectively being run by Westminster. And in any case, the majority of elected positions are usually stitched up by the main sectarian parties, Protestant and Catholic. But you were elected as a councillor on an anti-sectarian socialist programme. How can workers and young people in the North achieve genuine political representation of their interests? The first thing to note is that Northern Ireland is not actually run from Westminster at the moment. We're in a kind of nether-nether world where we haven't got a function in executive for over a thousand days now. It's like if we were a country, which we're not, we're a region, but if we were a country, we'd have the world record for no government, right? This has never happened anywhere else. So we've had no direction at all at the highest levels because of there's a whole range of issues that's caused that. Primarily, it come down to Sinn Féin DUP were the main two parties in government, and they failed to deliver anything for the working class people. Every policy, PFI, private finance initiative, huge waste on that, tax cuts, the implementation of universal credit, which didn't have to happen in Northern Ireland. They actually passed a law to give the Tories the power to implement it in 2015. They brought forward privatisation in the NHS under the Bengoa process. So there's a whole range of policies, all of which have been anti-worker. And it has caused, I think, an underlying destabilization of the power sharing institutions. There was a very significant strike in 2014 and March, where all basically Northern Ireland came to a standstill, and it was against the policies of the executive. Then the thing that pushed over the edge, though, I think, was the RHI crisis, which is a renewable heating initiative crisis, which mm-hmm. was the cash for ash, where hundreds of millions of pounds were given out to businesses, basically, and connected bodies and parties to get renewable heating installed. And this caused huge problems for the finances, obviously, of Northern Ireland. And on that basis, the assembly, the executive collapsed. But it's collapsed on and off, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the first time it actually collapsed on the basis of real social and economic issues. It usually collapses on the basis of sectarian polarization. But the parties, because of that, were in real trouble, both sides. And so what they did was they translated this collapse into a collapse about language, about emblems and the past and conflict and all this stuff that they're very comfortable in because it reasserts their support base. And they translated a collapse that was rooted in social and economic failure and neoliberalism into a collapse that's back into the safe silos of sectarian division. And again, this is a major factor why the whole situation is so polarized and quite unstable at the moment. And then you have the Brexit thing on top of that. So you, a thousand days of that. 
And obviously, a lot of young people are looking, well, completely alienated, completely alienated from the DUP who are against LGBT rights or against women's rights or against, uh, you know, don't even believe in evolution, some of them. Like, this is genuine truth. There's a DUP minister inserted a creationist explanation into the Giants Causeway. There's an exhibition space and the explanation of how this scientifically come about. And in the middle of it is the creationist explanation that was put there by a DEP minister. You know, this is the sort of government we have here. And the young people looking at it going, that's terrible. And they're looking, Sinn Féin's just kind of like reacting to that in a very narrow way, failing the grasp thing, and they're doing so on a neoliberal basis. So there's a lot of young people looking what is the alternative. And some of them are going into the trade union movement. There's a move into hospitality and the precarious work. And so that unionization is becoming a big thing. There is obviously the Extinction Rebellion. And there's a lot of mobilizations around women's rights, LGBT rights, very big mobilizations. And there is like a, a grassroots insurgence. But it hasn't taken the form of political challenge. And what we would like to see is that the movement moved beyond, say, for example, trade union consciousness or isolated campaigns and individual issues into a real socialist or labor, cross-community labor movement and finds a political expression. And that's the only way we'll ever change Northern Ireland. And it has to be done on a cross-community basis that brings everyone together on the basis of a common shared working class program. Good, thank you. I'm interested in the impact that the repeal of the hated and really horrible Eighth Amendment in Southern Ireland in 2018 has had, you know, it took place after a long campaign. And we've seen that in the Southern Ireland, marriage equality for LGBT people has been implemented in law. And abortion rights and marriage equality have been passed by Westminster following long campaigns. But I think we as socialists know from experience, it's one thing to change things in law, but it can be very different actually on the ground. And quite often it takes further campaigns to make things a reality. So I was going to ask you, what is the reality for women and for LGBT plus people now? What impact have these changes in the law had for them? Well, I think they are historical successes. There's no doubt of that. It's taken decades to repeal the Eighth Amendment. I didn't think we would win the abortion thing so quickly in the North at all. It happened almost through the parliamentary contingencies of the Brexit process, really. It was passed in the Northern Ireland Act, nothing to do with abortion, but they put in rights for abortion and rights for LGBT equality. Obviously, they do represent successes. As it stands, LGBT people now can get married equally, and in theory, you can access abortion in Northern Ireland without being criminalised, but the way it's been done is that there's no guidance as to how abortions can be conducted, It has decriminalized it, and there's obviously a reaction. There are elements in society, both north and south, within the medical institutions who refuse to get involved in this, and it's quite difficult, obviously, to overcome that. So there's a battle to be fought in terms of making sure that these translate into universal access, in particular in the north, free at the point of delivery locally. That all has to follow through. There needs to be guidance. I think the government's going to issue guidance in terms of how abortions are to be provided and all of that. There's also a bit of division about how many weeks and all this stuff. In the South, the number of weeks is far lower than is currently in the UK. And there's a debate whether the North will follow the Southern system or will follow the GB system. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a need to keep the pressure on. The trade union movement in the North has been more vocal in this probably than in the South, I think, would be safe to say. The union like Unite has had a fairly strong position on it. And we need to keep the pressure on now to make sure that these translate into real concretized freedoms and victories for women and LGBT people. However, these are not the only issues in play. There's so many other aspects. Northern Ireland is quite an old-fashioned society. It's Women definitely have, a, unfortunately, a subordinate position still. Attitudes are quite sexist. The court system is clearly discriminatory against women. Rates are clear up for sexual abuse, for rape, are really, really low. We've also got a huge problem because of the conflict in many regards around domestic violence. There's like The violence in society has come into the house. That's a big thing. And there's childcare. And there's so many issues here. It's not just these headline issues, but they need to be dealt with, and they need to be dealt with as part of a wider, broader fight for equality. And women's equality in terms of economic, to underpin it, Traditionally, women in Northern Ireland would have had far lower participation rates in the labour force. 
And women's wage rates tend to be lower proportionately to men's in general. There's structural disadvantage. Women tend to be in lower paid sectors or maybe more accurately, the sectors in which women are are lower paid. You know, there's there's a subtle difference there. There's a lot to be fought on here. Another issue is not talked about is like racial inequality in Northern Ireland and in Republic. Huge issues right now. There's massive mobilizations around it. And for socialists, these are issues we have to mobilize on, we have to fight on, and we have to continue to struggle to secure because they're important in terms of building the cohesion necessary to take on capitalism in the workplace. And in many cases, some of these strikes are actually led by women workers coming into struggle because they're often in the lowest pay sectors. They've been precarious work and there's also sexual abuse or sexual harassment in the workplace. It's quite endemic. Sexual abuse in care workers is unbelievable. This is the reality. And that's the underbelly of capitalist society in Northern Ireland. Everyone talks about the green and the orange issues, but the reality for especially migrant workers from female workers, hugely exploited hugely exploited and we have to find a way to even engage with those people because they're so isolated at times so there's so many issues yeah huge issues and huge problems and and so although there's been a huge change in attitudes north and south in ireland to things like abortion and marriage equality Mm. there's like you say there's a lot of other things need to be put in place to really achieve that and to give women genuine choice when it comes to abortion and not making a decision to have an abortion for economic or social reasons but actually just because they want to or don't want to have a a child so what kind of program would we put in place to deal with all those issues that you've spoken about and to give people genuine choice and to overcome all that prejudice that they come across how can we make it better i mean that's a big yeah. program but we would need a sources program to, to do that it's a it? trans fundamental transformation of society is necessary and it's almost impossible to think of all the things you would need to do and put into place to actually start but the main thing is the subjugation of working class people unless working class people are in power in society and able to make changes nothing's going to really change. There'll be maybe concessions made. There has been a sea change in attitudes, absolutely. But does it necessarily relate into a wider transformation that's necessary for real, genuine equality, for real freedom, human freedom for women, for LGBT, for minority groups? No. And a lot of the time in Northern Ireland, our focus is almost exclusively at the level of you know, the sectarian divide and the constitutional issues. Mm. But often these issues are subterranean, but they're really important and they're not dealt with Sex abuse issue in my own area is another issue. Child sex abuse endemic, it appears, and never dealt with conclusively by the institutions Mm -hmm. of the state. And it's all mixed into the history of the conflict. Mm -hmm. How the conflict worked means that these sort of barbarous sort of practices were quite normalized and almost ignored because they were ordinary decent crimes, Mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the political crimes, which the state was much more concerned with. So we have a long way to go in Northern Ireland, and the only way we're going to overcome that is by workers coming together, getting organized, and taking up a coherent and principled socialist campaign for change. And I think the success we've had in my own election and in the skill shows that this is possible. And this is possible in a relatively rural area like Inniskillen. It's certainly possible throughout the rest of Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. And I think the program, the CWI in particular, and the tradition actually lights the path forward for working class people. For oppressed minorities and for women who suffer inequality, a programme that lifted their minimum wage, a programme that had a massive council Mm. house building programme that would give them the option of leaving an oppressive relationship, all of that would help to overcome the problems of sexual harassment, sexism, Mm. if people had more economic independence but the only way that you could guarantee I think you're saying is if we have a full socialist transformation of society where workers control the resources yes. in society nationalize the banks and the building societies put that into democratic workers control that would allow us to start building a society that would develop free of inequalities and oppression yeah. and we could go forward for socialism and I think that's really a very positive way of looking at things and so I think if we look at the future for young people in Ireland north and south how would you see their future developing? The future of young people anywhere in the world is an open question we've got runaway 
potential climate change. We've got barbarism spreading across the world in terms of imperialist adventures. We have the potential for Northern Ireland to go backwards. Inherent within such a divided society where there's massive uncertainties around the constitutional issue, there is inherent a tendency for conflict to return. Only socialism offers a way forward on that. Many young people are completely alienated with the politics of Northern Ireland, the culture of Northern Ireland. So many leave because they just don't see their future there. But the other side of it is the more dominant, and I think the positive side is that young people can make a change. Young people are feeling increasingly empowered to do so because of so many technological developments. They've got mechanisms for their voice to be heard. It is also what's happening globally. They're looking to the environmental movement, to the, the women's movement, to the movement in general for socialist change. Young people are looking to those things and saying, you know, we could have that here and why not? I have got a question about Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, yeah. who've lost their electoral position. The politics of the Republic has, since the inception of the state, has been very backward, and Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael have dominated politics, especially Fianna Fáil. But undoubtedly, the experience of the crash 2008 and how the bankers were protected, the austerity that was imposed on working class people, resulted in a catastrophic questioning of Fianna Fáil in particular, and Fianna Gael to some extent, to the point that they were, between them, unable to form a government and had to form a Fianna Gael minority government with Fianna Fáil support. A very potentially interesting situation in the history of Ireland. There was then the move between some on the left to see how could we form an opposition, that, including Sinn Féin, which itself would be problematic if you think about the implications from the north. But there is obviously a natural yearning for something that's different. And the Labour Party, the traditional Republic of Ireland Labour Party, has, because of its almost like to the right of Blairism in terms of how bad it's behaved and for so long, there's absolutely no faith in that party. Do you think we need a new mass worker? Undoubtedly we do. It's how we get there. The workers need to come together. The unions need to take the lead on it. And they need to do that in the North too. We haven't got one. And that's the way we'll change this, is a mass workers party with radical socialist policies appealing to all sections of our community with an internationalist vision and an internal democratic culture. That's great. Thank you, Donald, for explaining the situation. Thank okay. you. All the best. Socialism has traditionally, and Labour politics has traditionally, been the real opposition in Northern Ireland. From the very establishment of the North, the carnival of reaction, as James Connolly called it, North and South, with partition, the Labour Party was the opposition, and it was much more feared by the unionist establishment than any other organisation. They didn't fear the nationalists in the side beyond them. They didn't mind them because they were capable of withstanding that. But what they couldn't withstand was the unity of workers and the inspiration that was derived from the international socialist movement. So there is a possibility of a trade union, a Labour alternative coming forward, a real socialist politics in the middle of that. It's not certain that we have to face conflict. It's not certain that we have to face the possibility of a, a vicious, brutal civil war and a repartition, which is possibly what you could see happening in the worst case scenario. That does not have to be our future. There's a hope for a progressive alternative, and that hope is lit up by the CWI. It's the politics of the CWI that lights up our future. We stand against individual terrorism, we stand against state repression, we stand against sectarian division, we stand against coercion of a minority who happened to lose, whichever side it is, the border poll. We stand for a socialist Ireland and a socialist federation of England, Scotland and Wales and a socialist Europe and a socialist world. And it isn't a utopia, it's the only way forward. And we stand in solidarity, comrades, and we'll be on the path to victory. And now the latest on Britain's general election campaign. First of all, the Labour Party manifesto was released yesterday as we're recording this segment for the podcast on Friday the... What is the date today? 22nd. On Friday the 22nd of November. And it's got some fantastic headline policies in it. It promises to build half a million council homes over the course of a five-year parliament. That's 100,000 council homes a year. This is compared to the Tories' measly 6,000 council homes 
in the past year. It promises to raise the minimum wage to at least £10 per hour without youth exemption, so that's for all workers would have that minimum. And it promises to ban the hated plague of zero-hour contracts. It promises to scrap the latest anti-union laws and also allow workplace balloting. That means that you are allowed to take a vote on whether or not to strike in the workplace itself through a collective meeting with your rep there, which was one of the first attacks on the trade unions made through the laws by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, along with other measures to strengthen trade unions and also renters unions. So it's a real attack on the rich and it's a real attempt to reach out to and improve the lives of working class and young people. And it's been received that way, actually, by the right wing press who have gone apoplectic about this programme, despite the fact that it's actually still quite modest. Now, it is a step forward on 2017, which was itself a huge breath of fresh air. The first anti-austerity, non-neoliberal manifesto from a major party in three decades. This is actually bolder and more left wing than that. And it gives you a little glimpse of the sort of vision of a society which is actually civilised, which is not like the capitalist horror which people have been trapped in in Britain and around the world, well, really for the past two or three centuries, but in particular for the past two or three decades. It gives you a little taste of that. So it could engender huge enthusiasm in working class people if it's gone out and fought for. Now, we have some thoughts about the policies in that manifesto and also some thoughts about how best to fight for it, which we'll cover in some more detail in, we hope, a future episode of this podcast. But first, here's Ian Patterson with some of the latest on the general election campaign itself. Well, thanks, James. Now, for a lot of people, the NHS is the big issue in the election, bigger than Brexit, according to some of the polls. Mm -hmm. Boris Johnson has said that the Tories are the party of the NHS and they're (laughs) going to build 40 new hospitals No surprise, those are both lies. (laughs) Um, Just give you an idea of Tory NHS policy. In 2015 manifesto, they promised an extra 6,000 GPs. In this manifesto, they're promising an extra 5,000. But actually, there's 1,500 less GPs today than there were four years ago. (laughs) That's a result of Tory cuts and privatisation, which has wrecked the NHS. That could be even worse in a post-Brexit trade deal between Johnson and Trump, well, they'll hand the NHS over to big private companies in the US to make a profit out of. The Tory Health Secretary, Matt Honcock, said, no more privatisation on my watch. Now, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Mm. Now, Labour's record on the NHS, we can't forget, under Tony Blair, was cuts, was privatisation, going even further than Thatcher dared to go in attacking the NHS. That's one of the reasons that Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party to reject those neoliberal policies. This time around, in this election, Labour's promising an extra £55 billion in England for the NHS and mental health services and equivalent increases across the UK. Mm -hmm. They're promising to scrap prescription charges, scrap car parking charges and reinstate nurses' bursaries Mm -hmm. instead of being charged tuition fees to do a hugely important job, as well as providing free personal care for people with the most severe needs. We say that last policy in particular, Labour councils have got to oppose the council cuts, the cuts to social care that are happening locally if they really want to implement policies like that. The manifesto says they're going to end privatisation. They're going to not renew the private contracts in the NHS when they expire. We say don't wait. Kick out the privatisers right now, Mm -hmm. day one of Labour coming to power. Labour also says because of increases in prices... By the profiteering drug companies, that's going to cost an extra £18 billion for the NHS. They do have some policies to deal with that, mm-hmm. more regulation, and a state manufacturer of these drugs to try and compete with the private companies. Mm-hmm. We say a much more effective way to deal with those rises is nationalising all the major pharmaceutical drug companies under the democratic control of the working class, so you can actually provide decent cheap, affordable, well-funded, well-researched services drugs for the National Health Service. We're fighting for workers' control in the NHS, and we think it's workers' and trade union struggle that can help achieve that alongside implementing these policies. 
And that's important because if we simply stick to regulation, of course, the bosses will try and undermine you because they don't like their profits being hit. There's no guarantee that they will actually divert funds into the sort of research to cures rather than just treatments, which is needed. All sorts of issues like that. And this point, by the way, about a post-Brexit Tory NHS deal, we should also make the point that a neoliberal Remain deal for the European Union would be disastrous for the NHS because a lot of the marketisation and privatisation which has happened has been with the assistance of EU directives which force public services to be opened up to privatisation. So leaving the EU on workers' terms, a pro-worker socialist internationalist Brexit under a Jeremy Corbyn-led government would be the best result for the NHS. Remain or leave, if it's on the basis of capitalism, is only going to mean more cuts and privatisation. So there's also been disastrous flooding in parts of Britain. Yeah, in Derbyshire and South Yorkshire, one of the local residents, Socialist Party member, Steve Flint from Bentley in Doncaster, he was affected by the floods. Mm. He said he would have been completely flooded out if it wasn't for the working class solidarity of his neighbours, people in the middle of the night coming to help each other to put standbags up to stop the worst things from happening. Mm -hmm. It's capitalist driven climate change that does contribute to extreme weather happening, including here in Britain, and the cuts to public services, we know the effects of the cuts. And it's the same, again, with the floods. Yeah, there's been some big spending on big capital projects around uh, preventing flooding, but there's been cuts to staff, cuts to flood defences as a result of the Tories austerity nationally and being implemented by local councils. Socialist Party members on the ground in the areas that were affected say there was massive anger at Boris Johnson and his Tory government. Initially, he refused to call it a national emergency, which would have released more funds to go out to help the victims of this flooding. Only pressure by Jeremy Corbyn forced him to do this. But still, there's going to be a fight over how much money, how it's going to be spent. Mm -hmm. The local secretary of the Fire Brigades Union pointed out that they've just saved 84 firefighters in the area. Imagine how much worse it would have been if they hadn't won that campaign. And for jobs. Exactly. And, mm. how, and those firefighters were missing during the flooding, mm. needed to help. And let's not forget, Boris Johnson, when he was London mayor, he closed 10 fire stations, got rid of 14 fire engines and sacked 552 firefighters from their jobs. And unfortunately, right wing Labour politicians have carried out similar attacks in local areas on other parts of the country. Yeah, and to working class people, they don't care whether these cuts are coming from a Tory council, Tory government or a Labour council. Mm. But Labour in its manifesto has promised £5.6 billion to deal with flooding, investment in flood defences and to prevent these things happening again. That didn't stop there being anger at the Labour Party against local Labour politicians mm -hmm. for not standing up to the Tories, for not doing enough. And it's just another example that even though Labour's promising to put money in, Jeremy Corbyn's anti-austerity message is muffled because you've got right-wing Labour MPs that are pro-austerity, right-wing Labour councillors implementing austerity. And just another example why we need mandatory reselection in the Labour Party and the Blairites have got to go. They've got to be kicked out. They've got to be deselected. That's right. Of course, we see Labour as two parties in one. In this election, we are supporting the Jeremy Corbyn wing to come to power because it has the potential to be the foundation of a new mass working class party which can adopt socialist policies and really fight for them. The Blairite wing of the Labour Party get absolutely no support from us because they are the ones who are discredited, not just Jeremy Corbyn now, but have also attacked working class people just like the Tories have in previous decades and should not be given an inch. Now, in the Labour manifesto, you've already mentioned a few things that Labour's promising to nationalise. Mm -hmm. One that came out in the last week is nationalising broadband, Labour promising to take over BT and open reach. It's absolutely clear that the capitalist market has failed. Only 6% of the country have fibre optic broadband going right up to their front door. And even a Tory minister admitted that the capitalist market is going to keep on failing, that it's going to be impossible to get it to everybody in the country. <laughs> the Tories are promising to put in £5 billion, i.e. £5 billion of our money, mm. that they'll have to then hand over to private companies to administer and make profit out of. And that's why it's good that Labour's called for its nationalisation. We say that's got to come with uh, workers' control. That's definitely going to win over the people that work for these companies at the moment. There's a bit of talk about some kind of workers' control, for example, around energy nationalisation in the Labour manifesto, mm -hmm. but real democratic control by the working class, people that work in these industries, people that use them, that's got to be a part of Labour's nationalisation plan 
for every industry. A lot of workers will have shares and pensions in BT. Labour's got to make clear that those workers are definitely not going to lose out as a result of nationalisation. In fact, they're going to benefit. But who will lose out? The fat cats that have gotten rich off these. Mm. We want them to lose out. We're going to be taking their wealth and money. That's one way you can pay for nationalisation, as well as increasing the taxes on the super rich and bringing the banks and the rest of the big tax dodging, exploiting corporations into democratic public ownership. That's another way you can use the resources in society that we create, take it off the rich, hand it over to the workers. And this point about workers' control is very important. It's extremely welcome that even though there's not a lot of detail on it, it at least gets a mention in one part of the Labour manifesto because nationalisation in the past was done either handing the power back to the same old capitalist managers who ran it as a private industry, who carried on running it in very much the same way, or to distant senior civil servants in Whitehall who have no idea what the situation is on the ground, can't respond dynamically to how things are actually developing in the industry, and are very like the old capitalist managers in the old industries. We want working class people in control for the reason that then it can be run in the interests of wider society rather than for the personal careers of the very wealthy or the personal wealth of the billionaires. Yeah, socialist nationalisation is completely different from what's gone before. And finally, some points on the housing crisis. Corbyn is promising to build 100,000 council homes and 50,000 social homes every single year. A lot of people are going to welcome that. We say they should be all council homes. Mm. You don't, there's no need to have them in any kind of arm's length. Let's have them controlled directly by democratically elected councils, democratic control by working class people in the areas that they're being built. And there's also some mention of welcome rent control in the Labour manifesto. Corbyn says that rents are only going to go up in line with inflation. That's a big break with the massive unaffordable hikes that people have at the moment. But the point is people can't afford the rents at the moment. Rent control has got to be a massive reduction of rents to make it genuinely affordable. And how do you pay for that? Again, taking the banks into democratic public ownership, controlled by the working class, taking over the big exploiting construction companies, taking over the land that's owned by a tiny number of rich aristocrats, including the Queen, mm -hmm. and using those resources controlled by the working class democratically to build the kind of homes that people actually want and want to live in. And this is a good policy, but Jeremy Corbyn, we think, ought to be instructing Labour councils to initiate it immediately during the general election campaign. In fact, they ought to have used their reserves and borrowing powers to start this sort of programme many years ago, and that could have forced the Tories out of government. But certainly right now, when a lot of people in local areas are looking at Blairite Labour councils, the right wing, the other party in Labour, the capitalist party, which is one of the two parties in Labour, and saying... But you're the same as everyone else. We don't trust you to actually implement policies that will change our lives. If you instruct councils to actually start doing this stuff on the ground, that could win the election because it would show people in practice what socialistic policies could mean for their lives. And furthermore, in the event that Jeremy Corbyn then didn't win the election, those councils would still be in a strong position because that would be so popular with local people. They could go to a Tory government, if that is what is returned on the 12th of December, and say to them, we dare you to shut down our council house building programme. You, you compare what the policy you've just described versus what the Tories are putting forward. Mm. Savage Javid has said he's going to build 200,000 houses a year. Obviously, they're not going to be doing that. <laughs> they're relying on the private sector to do it. And if you look at a lot of figures, that's actually less than is being built at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so the Tories are promising to build less homes. But no one can afford anyway. Exactly. In the private sector, a pathetic amount of council homes, even some Tory commentators have said Tory's policy is pathetic. <coughs> Karl Marx said theory is a guide to action. Here's the latest on worker struggles that have happened in the last few days, starting with posties in the Communication Workers' Union. So the Communication Workers' Union, as we have reported in previous episodes, has suffered a severe blow from the court system, which has ruled their overwhelming vote for national strike action illegal. The leadership of the Communication Workers' Union called for this morning, Friday morning, a national day of gate meetings, so postal workers gathering at the gates to their depots and discussing with their reps what's going on, what the way forward might be. And these have taken place in many offices. Socialist Party members all across the country have been going to visit posties at these gate meetings and even if they're not happening, visiting them on the gate to offer our support and our solidarity. We would reiterate that we maintain our unequivocal support for whatever action CWU members decide to take in pursuit of this dispute. And we would reiterate our call 
for the General Council of the Trade Union Congress, which brings together all of Britain's unions to call an emergency meeting, along with Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, the leaders of the left wing of the Labour Party, the national leaders of the Labour Party, to discuss what action to take. And this should include calling an emergency national demonstration in support of the postal workers and in support of the right to strike. Now, the reports that we've been getting from around the country today indicate the mood is still very angry. The postie who I spoke to on the gate in North London this morning said to me, the management breaks the rules all the time. Most of the year, when you want to get a little bit of extra cash, you need some extra money to make the rent or whatever, and you ask them for overtime, they say, no, we will not give you overtime. And they cite things like the European Union's working time directive as an excuse for not being allowed to give them overtime. But then in the run up to Christmas, where we are now, the management breaks all the rules. Working time directors out the window, all the rules about when you're allowed to knock on people's doors, what time you have to deliver. They're just completely ignored in order to do this mad dash to get all the money at Christmas. Now, this CWU member was therefore incensed that actually the postal union, the CWU, has jumped through all these hoops which are established by the Tories' anti-trade union laws to get a legal vote to go out on strike. And then this one unelected judge just goes, nope. They break the rules all the time. The CWU has followed all the rules and it's just struck down like that. So I think a lot of CWU members will be asking themselves, well, look, if the management breaks the rules all the time, the High Court said we can't do it. Why shouldn't we break the rules? And of course, if Postis did decide to take unofficial action, the Socialist Party would be in full support of that. The other thing that this postal worker said to me is that, of course, if the union decides to appeal the High Court decision, which is a legitimate tactic, the courts will be setting the date at a time which is best for the establishment. And that means after the general election, after Christmas, to limit the impact of the strike. So this is an urgent tactical question. And the Socialist Party has raised in our material that there will be understandable concerns in the ranks of the union, that a vacuum could form, that there could be a certain drift in this very important dispute that could develop if there is no clear direction given from the CWU leadership to the members. We hope to have more on that dispute as it continues to develop. So university workers are taking strike action too? That's right. 60 universities are going out for eight days from Monday the 25th of November. Socialist Party members in the University and College Union, which is leading the strike, wrote in the Socialist newspaper this issue, Like many workers, we've had enough of excessive workloads leaving us stressed and exhausted. We've had enough of insecure contracts leaving us worried about where our next work will come from or how to pay our bills. It's unacceptable that our managers make us pay more in and get less from our pensions, that our pay has fallen about 20% in real terms over the past 10 years, and that universities won't agree to address the gender and ethnic pay gaps. Ultimately, we've had enough of the marketisation of the higher education sector, which has seen the erosion of work and learning conditions disadvantaging staff and students to drive up profit. We'll be out on the picket line supporting them, and I'm sure other trade unionists will be as well. And if you want to get out and support those picket lines, you can come along to your local university when it's out on strike. I think it's no doubt students on the campuses are going to be supporting their workers, their staff taking strike action. That's right, and socialist student societies have been organising that solidarity up and down the country as well. So the General Secretary election for the Civil Service Union PCS is still running? That's right. It's begun. The Socialist Party's Marion Lloyd is standing to become General Secretary of the PCS Union to offer an alternative to the growing bureaucracy and increasingly, unfortunately, weak industrial and political strategy at the top of the union. I've got a couple of little quotes here from PCS Union members about why they're backing Marion Lloyd to become General Secretary. We'd love to hear her. First from Fiona Brittle, who's a member of the PCS's National Executive Committee. Fiona says... Marion Lloyd is committed to delivering a programme of action that puts lay reps, PCS members and the working class front and centre. I have watched as the senior leadership of PCS become ever more content to let full-time, unelected officers take control of union activities over lay reps, often with the result of quashing any dissent or alternative viewpoints, even to the extent that Mark Sawatka, who's the current General Secretary, backed a full-time officer against the elected candidate of his own faction in the union for assistant general secretary. Marion, as general secretary, would be a true servant of the National Executive Committee and wider union. And this is from Michael Kavanagh, who's the president of the PCS union group in the Land Registry. Now, having lost two national ballots on pay, 
we need a fresh look at tactics and campaigning. I believe that Marion provides this, as has been evidenced by her leadership in the latest successful Bayes dispute. Bayes is the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. You, you managed to say it all in there. <laughs> they keep, the initials stay the same, but what they stand for keeps changing. Michael goes on to say Marion can re-energise PCS as a campaigning team that wins for members. So the ballot closes on the 12th of December, same day as another important event. So anyone who is in the civil service and a member of the PCS union, and if you're not a member of the union, you should join. We urge you to vote for Marion Lloyd and get that ballot paper in the post. Yeah, on the 12th of December, you can vote to get a fighting trade unionist at the head of PCS and vote to kick out the Tories too. I probably can't put that in because the 12th of December is the close date, so I think the ballot paper has to be received by the 12th of December. <laughs> nice pun, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bad tactics here. And finally, library and museum strikers in Bradford in Yorkshire have entered their third round of strike action. Here's Socialist Party organiser Ian Dalton interviewing one of the union reps on the picket line. My name's John Giles. I'm a union rep for Unite in uh, Bradford Libraries and Museums. So today is the beginning of the third round of strike action taken by Unite members in Bradford Libraries and Museums. How do you think the dispute's going so far? It's going fantastically well. We've got really, really good support from members of the public. We've had fantastic turnout from members of the public for the demos and staff at the picket lines and things. So really it's getting that message out there so people are aware of what's going on because the council have tried over the years to make these cuts without letting people know what is actually going on. And there's a fantastic turnout today, you know, despite it just being Keithley Library on strike today, the picket line's as full as it was when everybody was out at the beginning of the dispute. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's true. And one of the reasons why we've decided to do targeting of libraries is to mitigate the financial aspect against our members and also the people who use the services because the last thing we want to do is put our members in financial hardship and impact the service users. Some of them rely on this service so that's what we're doing with that and it's been fantastic today. It's really shown how successful it can be. And last week I believe there's a meeting between yourselves and the council and the rally today you were saying how the strike so far has forced the council to move from their position but obviously that's not enough. Would you be able to sort of maybe give a bit more information on that? We are aware that the councillors are looking at cutting less than they were going to. We also know that they're looking at paying for the city centre rent from another source other than the libraries and museums budget. We do know that this year the dispute has cost the council, or they've paid £300,000 that they didn't want to pay. They wanted to make these cuts in April, so that money is, has gone in. And we also know from their own figures that there is actually an underspend in the Department of Place of £200,000. So the money is there. When people say there is no money, it's a lie. The money is there. And we have shown that if we stand in solidarity together, we can make that argument, we can make that case, and money will be found to protect these services. And obviously there's another three days of strike action coming up this week, and in a couple of weeks' time then there's further strikes planned if the council don't budge further. I mean, what would you say to anybody else who wants to come along and offer support? Oh, please, please come along. Come to the picket lines. We've got Facebook and Twitter feeds. Go to your local library. You know, one of the big things is go and use your library. It's a free service. You don't have to have any ID to come in to use it. Get yourself a ticket. Start using the service. Get involved in the engagement process that they've got at the moment. Now, that is heavily weighted towards reducing paid staff. It's heavily weighted towards the use of volunteers, self-service machines, closing libraries, reducing opening hours. Get involved in that engagement process. But let's use that process to tell the politicians, the councillors, what you want from the library service. 
Thank you very much, Sean. Right. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England Wales section of the Committee for a Workers International. This week we heard from Councillor Donald Coffey speaking to Heather Rowling, along with James Ivans and me, Ian Patterson. If you like what you heard, you can find out more about Donald's party, CWI Ireland, and contact them about joining at their Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Marxist CWI Ireland. You can find out more about the Socialist Party in England, Wales, and contact us about joining at socialistparty.org.uk. And if you live outside England, Wales or Ireland, and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Help us spread the word about socialism the podcast by giving us a five-star review and subscribing so you don't miss out. Don't forget to recommend us to your co-workers and friends. We also want you to send us recordings from picket lines and campaigns and reports of your activity. And we want your questions, comments and ideas for future episodes. Email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk Socialism the podcast has no wealthy backers. We survive thanks to the financial support of ordinary working class and young people. And we're proud of the political independence that gives us. If you like what you hear, help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.
Thank you. 
Thank you. 